Hi, so uh, welcome to this episode of Chats With, and today I'm joined by Robbie. Uh, Robbie, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are and uh, what you're about? Hi everyone, my name is Robbie Lockie and I'm the co-founder and director of Plant-Based News. Uh, we're a leading vegan news media and health, a plant-based health education platform and we disseminate the plant-based lifestyle uh, to a global audience, um, which is uh, our full-time, my full-time job. Fantastic. And how, how many um, followers and how much engagement do you get with plant-based news? We get a lot of engagement. Uh, we've been running three and a half years. Uh, we have a monthly uh, reach of 70 million. Wow. Um, and we have uh, about just shy of 2 million fans in total across all our platforms. Um, and it's a very lively and passionate audience. I don't know if you know any yeah. vegans, but uh, yeah, three kids <laughs> your kids are vegan, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're a very, very passionate um, and lively bunch. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a it's equal pleasure. It's equal kind of amounts of joy and um, kind of like angst that goes with working in this community. It's not easy, but uh, uh, yeah, I love it. And and how and how did you get here? What what, what sort of uh, what did your journey look like to get to that sort of three or four years ago? Mm. So I, I um, came to the United Kingdom uh, when I was nineteen in nineteen ninety nine. Um, and came from Zimbabwe. Um, I had been sort of studying telecommunications and electronics engineering, but wasn't really that happy about doing that kind of job. I found it was a bit too corporate for me. Um, and I always wanted to be a designer. So when I got to right. England, I worked in different agencies when I was 19, kind of junior designer, um, and sort of working more towards user experience design and became interested in product design on the internet. So using web apps to sort of tell stories or uh, promote brands um, and was very lucky to work in all kinds of amazing places. I worked for Jamie Oliver for several years, uh, Getty Images, and also worked on some very large agencies where I worked on things like Waitrose.com, the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, wow. um, and so many very, very large websites where I learned about the power of using digital technology to promote a brand, but also to um, tell stories and to mass mobilize as well. Um, mm. Up until a few years ago, um, I was predominantly doing digital again and kind of became a bit disillusioned by the corporate digital and advertising agency world um, and decided to start my own uh, digital agency called Loverita, where I did ethical and um, sustainable brands and products and charities and NGOs um, and worked on lots of different campaigns. Um, and I decided I also wanted to learn about campaigning itself. So how could I use right. my skills and tools to mass mobilize, but also to shift the opinions and views of potentially millions of people? Because I'd gone vegan about seven years ago and I I'd wanted to be able to find something to do with that too, um, that I could use those skills to, to educate people uh, about a plant-based diet. Um, and then about four years ago, I met uh, Klaus Mitchell, who I run Plant-Based News with, and we became good friends and decided that you know it would be great to work together and we got on really well and we kind of did it as a bit of a passion project here in this room um, mm -hmm. in our spare room um, and then after maybe about six seven months of working together um, we got an email from a guy from Saudi Arabia called Prince Khaled Walid. Uh, he's a vegan a prince a real vegan prince who wow. decided that he wanted to reach out to us um, and send us a message about what we were doing. And he said, Hey guys, uh, I think you're both great and love what you're doing. Uh, and I want to support you and not just with money. And so at first I didn't really think twice about the email. I, I didn't really know what it was about or who he was. Yeah. We get a lot, we got a lot of messages before that. So um, if I hadn't looked him up, uh, I probably wouldn't be sat here now. Mm. Um, and we did look him up and realized that he was the real deal. He is a real prince. He's an entrepreneur um, and a philanthropist and puts a lot of time and energy into creating and helping create businesses that are ethical and sustainable and involved in some kind of green energy or plant-based food technology. Right. And he, yeah, he replied. Uh, we sent him a, a lovely message back saying, thank you so much for, for, for noticing us. We really love that you you enjoy our content we didn't mention money or talk about anything like that and he actually responded straight back and he said wow i never thought you would you would reply um yeah. and i'm really impressed you didn't just ask for money <laughs> yeah um we weren't really thinking about money we were more just amazed that a saudi saudi arabian prince had noticed the work that we were doing 
Um, and he said, put, me, put a proposal together and tell me what you want to be able to quit your job so that you can build this platform and do what you want to do um, and spread this message as far and as wide as possible. And that was the task. And we did a proposal, Klaus and I stayed up to like 6 a.m. working on it. Um, and we presented it to him the next day and he, um, he loved it. And he said, let's do this. And he, yeah. he bought uh, a share in the business. Um, and over the last three and a half years, uh, well, the last two, two years, he supported us through his investment. Uh, we're now um, self-sustaining. And um, yeah, from a team of just two of us to a team of, we haven't got 10 full-time people, but we've got almost sort of 10 people at least working you know almost on a weekly basis on the platform uh, yeah and uh, yeah and we've grown considerably so that's how i ended up here wow so. that's such a fantastic story i mean that's great isn't it and how the kind of universe looking out for you and sending that person at the at the right time and you know to kind of yeah. get things going as well that's awesome yeah it has it has felt like that i think you know throughout my life it's, especially since i feel like i've aligned myself a lot more with um the greater good or great bigger causes uh, you know things have always sort of come just in the right amount of time mm. to support me and i've been very lucky and privileged to have people around me who believe in what i'm doing and um believe in what we're doing as well mm. as a as a sort of team um and everyone who works for us is very passionate about what we're doing and it it's less of a job more as a kind of family of people who really want to get this message to as many people as possible just because of the the timely timely nature of it and yeah the ticking time bomb that is humanity. <laughs> yeah. So, so talking of which, yeah, thinking about, I guess, the next sort of five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, and then about creating that kind of positive, progressive future. I mean, what, what, mm. what are some of the things that you would like to see or you think should happen, you know, in our mm. kind of society and environment and animal yeah. world? You know, it could be anything. You know, what, what, what do you think are the, 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 the kind of key things for us? Number one for me, the number one thing is 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 the re the reduction or complete removal of animal agriculture and the total rewilding of our entire country. Um, this island used to be completely covered with forest, but you know, sixty plus percent of it now is farmlands. Um, the biodiversity in in the United Kingdom is so minimal because of the way we live in, on this island. I want to see that change. I want to see a time where people come to this country to see the forest, to see the animals and to see the diversity. Um, animal agriculture is, you know, is a leading cause of uh, a lot of the damage being done to this planet. Ocean, dead zones, species extinction, habitat loss, river acidification. You, there's just a, a, a list as long as my arm of damage mm. that this, this kind of practice is doing to our planet. That being said, you know, huge monocrops are also damaging and also problematic and I want to see it where um, we have a more sustainable future with like vertical farms I'd love to see cities that are completely self-sustaining when it comes to food there is the space and the technology to feed an entire city with by itself without the need of huge amounts of land we have mm. those tools right now to be able to do it and I think we need politicians and governments to be innovative and willing to take risks to try new things um, with regards to energy, uh, I would like to see a total removal of all fossil fuels and, and, a, and a fully renewable system where uh, there is no such thing as a landfill where every piece of waste or, or um, you know, trash goes away and it goes to a place where it can be either turned into energy or it can be turned into something different. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to a sort of circular economy where you know, we buy things um, and when we're finished with them, they go back to the manufacturer and they tear them apart and they make something new. We should never be living in a world where we're constantly able to just buy, 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 buy. And then when it's at the end of its life, it goes in a landfill. Mm. You know, future generations are going to look back in horror at the way we live in, lived in this century, the last mm. two centuries. And I think and you, that fundamentally needs to change. Yeah. And do you, do you think, you know, sort of both those examples of, you know, sort of farming and sustainability and the circular economy and stuff, do you, what, what do you think... Um, I guess, do you think coming out of this kind of uh, corona um, virus and the crisis and stuff, do you think that, that that will help to shift people's mindsets or to look at the supply chain, to look at the way we live our lives and do we need to travel so much? And do you think that those things will be lasting and impactful on, on wider society? I'd like to say yes. I'd love to mm. say people will change. But if you look back through history, humans are not very good at that. We're very mm. good at 
uh, experiencing trauma and then forgetting about what happened. And that's reflected in the microcosm of our lives to the microcosm of our entire civilization. Um, it's, it's very hard to answer that. I don't know. I don't know if we can do it because I feel like we've, we've become a very conceited and um, selfish species. We don't think about the future. We have fostered short terminism, short terminism, short terminism between mm. <laughs> in our children uh, and, and, and in our society because everything is so instant now. Mm. Instant movies on Netflix, instant music on Spotify, instant relationships on on um, Tinder. You know, instant products on Amazon. Everything is like now, now, now. It's always about like instant gratification. Mm. Uh, without thinking about the consequences you know plastic is a really interesting manifestation of that single use plastic is almost the embodiment of our culture something that you mm. use to carry some food for a moment matter of seconds and then it's in the bin i mean we're just a fundamentally what we've become such a wasteful culture and society mm. and we're all guilty of it like i'm not sitting here going oh i'm zero waste and i just yeah. live on oxygen <laughs> <laughs> So I think I think there is chance. There is a possibility for change. I feel like there's a, a space in the clouds opening up now where people can see a future where we can live differently. We don't need so much stuff. We don't need to buy so many clothes and have so many shoes and travel so many times a year. Um, let's reinvest in our local economies and let's plant more forests and trees and try and encourage um, more people to sort of see their own country. I know so many people. I didn't grow up in England, but I know so many people who were born, born in this country on this island who haven't seen, haven't seen most of it, who haven't traveled yeah. to the beautiful islands and seen the, the mountains of, in Wales. And, you know, there is so much beauty here. You don't really have to go away three, four, five times a year. Um, obviously, mm. the weather is a problem, but, you know, yeah. it can be beautiful when it rains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and, from, and from your experience, especially over the last few years, because I guess a big part of it is actually getting people to take action, isn't it? And to make change happen and for themselves and then be part of something else as well. And one thing I've noticed, you know, I live in central London and during the lockdown, the first few weeks, the, the air was cleaner, the yeah. noise was gone, the sirens were gone. Uh, and it, you could hear the birds and, uh, you know, I'd never noticed the birds before. And I mean, we live in, you know, zone one. Uh, mm. And it was fantastic. And, and now slowly that's kind of eroded and we're back. You can smell mm. the pollution and, you know, the traffic's back and, and people are almost back to what it was like before. Yeah. And, and even though I, I kind of, you know, contacted the local council and said, you know, I'll be part, they're doing a scheme about getting people's opinions and how Islington people feel about that. And, you know, so they're going to try and do something about it. Mm. But it won't be that kind of radical change, I think, that we're sort of talking about in terms of, you know, reducing car journeys and pollution and noise and stuff. And how do you think, and from your experience, you know, we can, we can, create some of those kind of changes without without a trauma or without a kind of crisis point again if we look back at history the only time society has changed is when there's been a crisis and when yeah. people are forced to change i think because we're such a diverse society and culture with so many different types of people um we don't act as one unit we're not a tribe mm. we're not a tribe anymore we have no culture especially in the western world we all live separate and disconnected lives even though we're deeply entwined with each other lockdown and the, the pandemic has reminded us of how interconnected we are but like mm. culturally and, and you know and, and emotionally spiritually we i think we've never been more distant from each other and mm. i think this is where it's a real challenge now obviously for the most part people in the uk have acted on the, the guidance of the government and, and and followed the rules um I think, again, it's a point, you know, I don't want to start like a prophet of doom here. I think people, people are changing, but it's not fast enough. You know, yeah. climate breakdown and the climate <laughs> crisis is a real thing. It's a, it's a distance, not a distant, not such a distant tsunami that is coming. The number of people who are going to die and suffer from the climate crisis, and the climate breakdown are going to be, you know, tens of thousands of times more than a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have known about an incoming climate crisis since the turn of the 19th century so the early 1900s men were standing on stages in london talking about the damage to the skies because of the factories and people laughed at them and told them that they were you know um they were being hysterical mm. and you know 100 plus years later we're still having to fight and still having this conversation about is humanity having an effect on the environment the government in america is still pushing back wanting to you know burn more coal and um drill more oil um 
I think that we will see a total uh, and complete collapse um, of our biosphere. And only mm. then, I think, will humanity awake, awaken to the damage mm. that we've done. I feel like we, you know, again, I don't want to be too depressing, but I do want to be realistic. I feel like we need to wake up and realize that the time for action is over. It's gone. We, we had an opportunity to take action and we haven't taken it. So what we have to do is think about what's coming and how we can mitigate the damage to our society and how we can change accordingly. So we have to be aware that the food system is going to, uh, to um, experience irre irre irrevocable damage. Um, it's going to not be able to feed the amount of people um, that, it, that it currently is feeding. There'll probably be a lot of crop failures, a lot more floods and droughts and you know, swarms of locusts. So we just have to make the best out of a bad situation. I think that's what we have to be doing. Stop thinking about how to you know, make the future a better place because it's not going to be great for a lot of people. We need to mm. start thinking about the technologies and tools that we can use um, to plan for the worst. And if it doesn't happen, the worst doesn't happen, then great. If we plan for the worst and and those disasters don't come, then guess what? We we just we overplanned and it didn't happen. This is what frustrates me when when I hear people say, "Oh, they said you know millions of people are going to die of corona. Look, they're liars and there's conspiracy." It's like, well, mm. we plan for the worst. If it doesn't happen, if we build those big nightingale hospitals and they don't get full of people dying, that's a good thing, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's better to overplan and overestimate rather than you know uh, underestimate and then something really bad happens and we're completely caught off guard i think this is the problem is that as soon as you try to speak the truth about the reality of how bad things are people accuse you being uh, of being fear-mongering yeah i'm yeah. fear-mongering because i'm speaking the truth about what is really happening people want to hear these positive stories they just want to hear the good stuff and like we do need to hear good stories. We do need to hear the inspiring, positive stuff that's going on in the world. But we also need a dose of reality. Mm. And and so so just thinking about you know the, what we've just been talking about the last few minutes. You talked about moving to um, you know um, more of a plant based diet and the the reforestation and uh, you know putting the land back to to how it should be in the UK and other countries. And you talked about um you know the circular society and stuff and and the, the looking at the supply chains and localization all those things what about work what about our sense of being as as people and what we do and mm. uh you know that's sort of all tied up to mm. our day-to-day -day activities i mean what's your what's your view on what, what what we should be doing around that space I think that there should be a universal basic income that all people receive uh, a minimum amount of money every single month, whether they work or not. Mm. Um, and that, that gives them the ability to be able to buy the basics so that they can survive. Uh, because I know and believe that the automation uh, of our um, repetitive kind of task force, uh, workforce, is, is coming. It's already happening. Mm. People are losing their jobs left, right and center to machines, to AI um, and it's only going to get worse. There will be more and more people losing their jobs. Uh, fortunately for us in the creative industries, I don't know whether AI will be able to replace us anytime soon, but who knows? Once we have artificial intelligence, true artificial intelligence, maybe we will have digital creative directors that are yeah. in <laughs> AI, yeah. and, and you just speak to it, and you say, come up with some ideas, and it can instantly access all the knowledge in the world and come back to you with 20 ideas based on trends, based on information. You know, there is a world of possibility when it comes to AI. It means that we could potentially all stop working in jobs that are um, that a machine could do. But then what happens to those people? You know, how will they earn their money and how will they survive? And that's why I think mm. some kind of universal basic income is essential because not everyone has access to um, training and skills to be able to learn to become an architect or to become a lawyer or a doctor or, uh, you know, a highly skilled job so there's mm. a, a lot of our society which won't be able to um to work because the machines will replace them and there's mm. going to be potentially be a huge amount of poverty and total societal breakdown so i think we need to focus on well-being rather than gross national product right i think yeah. that you know, we should be focusing on how people feel in their lives and feel fulfilled and feel like they're actually a functional part of society and, and having a job doesn't necessarily mean that you're a functional part of society 
you know, if you don't have a job, maybe you help at the local, um, you know, old people's home, or maybe you yeah. volunteer at a school, or maybe you look after all the gardens in the city. And because you get a universal basic income, you can, you, you know, you do it because you love to do it rather than you're being paid to do it. Um, yeah. You know, and I think there has to be another way because I think the current capitalist model is broken. I think it's it's a house of cards. And this pandemic has exposed it for what it really is. It's an it's an illusion, really, yeah. which is a monster built to feed the pockets of the very few people on our planet. And I mean, the the whole um, you know universal basic income. Yeah, you know, one of the criticisms is that will people still be motivated to kind of take action and to do things? And and I, and I guess yeah. what you're saying in a way is about purpose, isn't it? It's, if you've still got a purpose and whether it's, it's looking after your local gardens or your or local elderly folks or whatever it is, but it's a purpose because that's important, isn't it? As humans is, is to have yeah. a, even people that go to work and work in the back office somewhere, they still have a purpose that they get up when they're part of a team and they, you know, process invoices, whatever it is, but it, it's, it's a, it's a, a thing to, to look forward to, to motivate, isn't it? It's a, and, and maybe, I think you were getting at it earlier is that if we, if we automate everything, if we become a society that's about artificial intelligence, it's about automation and all that's done. We really have to question about what it means to be human, what it means to be, um, you know, is it a kind of some kind of spirituality or consciousness or, because that's the only thing that we've got that machines haven't got, isn't it? It's consciousness. Mm. Well, that's, that's a big question. That's a, mm. I don't think that's a yes or no. I, I personally believe that consciousness is innate within the universe and mm. that consciousness, cause we have not, we're not able to explain why a collection of cells that sit between our two ears is able to ignite a conscious mind and become self-aware. I do believe that machines can become conscious just the same as human beings. If you create a complex enough mechanical system with the same level of um, interconnecting, uh, processing and cognitive abilities, I do believe a machine could be just as conscious, just as feeling as a human being. Because what are we other than biological machines, our cells and our neurons fire and interact with the outside world. And if we can engineer a machine that functions in the same way, that isn't an illusion, but a real thinking, feeling, um, uh, pondering, dreaming machine. Um, I do believe we'll see a world, if we survive and don't totally destroy the planet, I, yeah. I believe we'll see a world where human beings and uh, artificial life will live side by side. Now, we've all seen as sci-fi films where mm. the artificial life tries to wipe out humanity because, you know, we're a pretty destructive species. It wouldn't take long for a supreme intelligence to work out that actually we are a threat <laughs> mm. and to do away with us. But I'd like to think of us merging with our technology. I think of us as being a species that will one day leave this planet, but we won't be fully organic, that we will be part human, part technology. We'll augment our brains and our ears and our eyes and our hearts and like all elements of us will essentially sort of like merge into one and will become a kind of like thinking, feeling machine. Mm. Well, that's an interesting, uh, um, uh, Elon Musk has a similar uh, thing, doesn't he, about the vowel, isn't it? And having the vowel and, and being part of tech as well, as well as... Uh, yes, human. yeah. He thinks that we're all living in, a, in a, a simulation, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. That is kind of like, like, a, like a construct, like the Matrix, and that, um, you know, the, the difference between the reality that we perceive and the reality which is potentially the machine there is no way to tell whether this construct is an actual a simulation or whether it is real, even and if real even exists at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, Robbie, it's been great talking to you. Um, uh, and you. And, and just before we kind of finish up, I mean, have you got any last parting thoughts or, or, or kind of uh, you know, thinking about that creating the future, if we can take action, and, and as you said, kind of if, it, if it's mitigation or, you know, what, mm. what, what do you think people should be doing right now, I guess? I think what people should be doing right now is thinking about what they can do to um, create a better future. And that can mm. go in all different directions. And, and, you know, for me, it's as simple as starting by what you eat, what's, what you do three times a day, the food that you buy. It's a very good way to begin 
you uh, can dramatically reduce your carbon footprint by switching to a plant-based diet. Taking it a step further is moving towards becoming potentially an ethical vegan where you think about what you buy rather than just the fact that it removes animal products. You know, take chocolate, for example. If you buy chocolate that happens to be vegan, that just means there's no dairy or eggs in it, okay? But if you buy chocolate that involves slavery where children are being forced through forced labor in West Africa somewhere, that's not the most ethical choice. And there are other products out there where you could choose that you know the supply chain isn't involving some kind of human slavery. Right. So I think I wanted to see a future where people think about things in a broader perspective, rather than just being about animals or the environment or your health, is to think about everything and not be, become overwhelmed, but also just realize that every little action all adds up. That you know, each, if, each, if each and every one of us Think about how we could do a few things every week that just reduces our consumption or reduces our, um, our our previous way of living. It all it all adds up ultimately in the long run. And I think you know spreading that message and sharing with your friends and family to to take that time and make those choices. Um, I think is also a really, really vital part too. And that's something we can all do. And there's so much knowledge and information out there on how to to make these changes. So it's never been a better time. Great. All right. Well, on that advice, um, I want to thank you. I've really enjoyed it today. And um, right, hopefully, start. yeah, hopefully speak to you soon. Definitely. See you, everyone. See you.